everyone. Welcome to Access Chat. We um, have a guest on the show before, and we just really love her voice. We think it's a very important her voice. voice. So we wanted to bring her back to talk about this very important topic of opiates and pain and things that people uh, with chronic pain are dealing with uh, all over the world. Uh, Neil Milliken is not joining us today because he's on vacation um, in Madrid with his beautiful wife. And so a Antonio and I have the pleasure of um, having Kate Nicholson again. And Kate, even though you've been on the show before, would you still um, tell the guests who you are and a little bit about, you're going to repeat yourself. And I recommend to everybody to go back and watch the other video, that interview we did with Kate. And we'll actually include that so it's easy to find. But tell the audience who you are, Kate. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to also say that this month is Pain Awareness Month, which is part of the reason we're having the conversation that we are right now. Um, so my name is Kate Nicholson. I worked uh, in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice for more than 20 years, um, primarily enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act. So um, I helped draft the regulations under the ADA, brought a number of cases in federal court, and supervised cases. Uh, so that's my professional background. At the same time, about uh, a year into my legal career, I developed uh, very debilitating, very extreme and uh, chronic pain. Uh, I was working one day at my desk, my back started to burn um, and my muscle seized and I ended up on the floor lying down. And um, after that point, um, I really couldn't sit or stand or walk for the better part of, uh, for about 15 years. Things started to improve about 15 years in. Um, so, uh, it turned out that the pain was related to a surgery I'd had where a doctor severed nerves in my spine, nerve plexuses. Um, and I feel passionately about this issue in part because part of what helped me work and function, even though uh, I refused to take them for many years initially, uh, was, was uh, proper pain medication with opioids um, and integrative care. And what's happening today with the opioid epidemic is that even though most people who take pain medication for pain um, don't have, don't develop problems with addiction, don't abuse their medication. We do have an opioid epidemic in this country. And one of the unintended consequences of our policy-based and regulatory approach to stemming opioid abuse has been a crackdown on legitimate use for people with cancer, for people with chronic pain, um, even for people with some acute pain. And so uh, when this started happening, I decided that I needed to step up and tell my story and advocate on behalf of chronic pain patients, even though I no longer require opioids for pain, um, I certainly would have been in difficult circumstances in the current environment. Probably would yes, have been to work. Right, and you're, and you're um, an attorney as well, so I, very, and Right, and I bring that up, and I know quite, um, Antonio has a question, but I only bring it up because sometimes when we're talking about opiates, people just assume things about the people. And you are a very well-educated, professional woman that um, unfortunately really had to deal with chronic pain and still do in your life. And so I can't think of a better spokesperson for us on these issues. And that's one reason why we access that we want to keep coming back and talking to you because you're sort of the accidental expert at it. So, uh, yeah. That's true. It, that's true. And I, I do think people perceive me differently because I went to Harvard Law School and had a, a strong career. Um, nevertheless, um, it, it shouldn't make me any more entitled to pain relief than anyone else. Sure, I agree, I agree. Antonio, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Deborah, and, and uh, welcome back, Kate. Uh, yeah. no, why, uh, is it, why is it so important to discuss chronic pain and why is it so, uh, important to have uh, you know, this month of September where we can uh, talk about it and you know, there are different organizations doing campaigns, why it's important to bring up uh, this conversation? That's a really good question, Antonio. I think the main reason is that in many ways, pain has been called a, a silent epidemic. 
uh, in this country, um, about a third of the, and really worldwide, about a third of the population has some form of chronic pain. Uh, the CDC in the United States just did a refinement to see, you know, that could be episodic pain a few days a month in that larger, a third of the population category. Um, about 50 million people in the United States have everyday, persistent everyday pain, and about 20 million have uh, disabling pain, pain that limits major life functions. So in terms of the numbers, it actually affects more people than cancer and heart disease and diabetes, um, and a lot of the chronic public health issues that uh, nations deal with. The problem is that we, um, we don't put a lot of research dollars toward pain. Uh, at least at NIH, historically, less than 1% of their annual budget is dedicated to pain research. Um, because we tend to think of pain as something that the body endures. I mean, everybody experiences pain. That's part of living in a What's different about chronic pain, pain that goes on for three months to six months or longer, is that it shifts from being something that preserves the body, which is its essential function, to something that actually damages the body. There are physiological changes, there are uh, neurological changes um, that can really damage people's health. Uh, there are studies that show that people with uh, moderate to severe chronic pain have a quality of life index that's very similar to people who are dying of cancer. So it is an urgent problem in terms of prevalence, in terms of the numbers, but we haven't really caught up with this problem in our culture, and you know, certainly in the United States, and to some degree, worldwide. I mean, it took a while for us to pay better attention to cancer, too. It took a while for us to pay attention to HIV, tuberculosis, these things you know, diseases have uh, a curve and, and, and uh, an awareness curve. Um, it is also a problem that in, at least in the United States, um, pain is rarely addressed in medical education, which is astonishing given that it's the number one reason people go to the doctor and the number one cause of disability in the country. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no so, it's a great but, response. No, it's hard to say that many Americans, when they go to work every day, they vote, they go in a condition of pain. Yes, okay. I think um, that's right. So how can you know? And this will affect you know, uh, work life, productivity. You no, know, what needs to you know, needs to be done in order to address this impact? Uh, impact? and the productivity impact that this has. Um, you're breaking up a little bit, Antonio, but I think you're asking sort of what needs to be done to change, to, to bring awareness to the social impact of pain. Um, no, I think more people... Yes, yes, yeah. And also, yes. no, this has a, a huge impact in productivity and work. Yes, it does. It does. And it, it can cost, uh, I think in the United States, it can, uh, some estimates say it costs a third of our budget. Um, so it, it is it is very significant, and it is the number one, as I said, uh, cause of long-term disability. So um, it it has an enormous impact. It simply has not had um, the attention that it deserves. I think, like I said, a lot of it is because we think of it as a normal physiologic uh, function, and it is. It's an essential function in acute pain and getting us to move our hand from the fire and getting us to rest our bodies when we're injured. But when it becomes chronic and intractable, it actually does the opposite. And many would argue it becomes a disease in its own right. A disease in some sense like cancer in the sense that it's a large umbrella category of diseases. There can be a lot of reasons people are in pain. You know, they can have MS, they can have rheumatoid arthritis, they can have suffered a traumatic injury or a surgical accident like I did. There can be a lot of reasons, and um, depending on the source of the pain, whether it's inflammatory or neuropathic, the treatment protocol may change. But as a category of diseases, it really is kind of analogous to cancer in, this, in terms of it, you know, its impact and the fact that it really has a distinct sort of physiological um, effect that harms the body. You know, Kate, when my husband 
had a uh, hip surgery. Um, he, he actually had both of his hips replaced, one at one point and then one at another. And he was on uh, opiates for that pain. And it, it was sort of scary how fast it sort of started wrapping itself around him and, and to the point where he, um, he, and he saw some personality changes he didn't like. So he, without doctor's orders, uh, went off suddenly. And when he went off, um, his body reacted violently to it and he was throwing up and it was really hard. And, and it was interesting because he was afraid to take the medication the doctors had prescribed for pain because he was afraid he was going to get addicted. I mean, it, it's yeah. the, and, and when you say doctors don't really learn a lot about pain in medical school, I, I just came back from the doctor. I have a little bit of tennis elbow and I went to the doctor because it got too painful, right? So I, that's why I go to the doctor. So this is such a huge multifaceted problem. People are afraid to use it. They need them. There's the, we were talking about before we went on air about shows. I was looking last night at a show called A Leaf of Faith. Um, it's a documentary on uh, Netflix. And it's talking about a plant I'm not familiar with. You are a little familiar, uh, Kratom. And I think that we're looking, we're all looking for solutions because so many people are impacted. And now we're saying opiates are all the problem. Let's get them off. Let's do legislations. And it's, it seems like we're trying to solve a problem without really understanding how big the problem is. Like Antonio said, the impact on the workforce the productivity. I know that when I'm in a bad mood, or I mean, when I'm in pain, I'm in a bad mood. I try to be above it and I, I'm blessed that I don't have to, I'm not dealing with chronic pain, but it, it's it's such a multifaceted, multidimensional problem. And that's problem. another reason why we're so, so supportive of your work, Kate, because you are one of the voices out there saying, okay, Let's consider all the pieces before we just start throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So how do how in the world do we wrap our hands around this? And once again, when we're getting, you know, you know, a leaf of faith on Netflix, is that what we do? I, it's very confusing to the public. It is confusing to the public. Um, so there's a lot packed in there. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we need to do wrap our hands around uh, the opioid epidemic is to see that um, in most cases today, the deaths that we hear about are not from pain medication that's prescribed by doctors. Um, they are mostly from illegally produced fentanyl and its analogs, from heroin, and where a prescription opioid is in someone's system, and anytime it's in someone's system, it will be counted as a prescription opioid death. In most of those cases, that person has five or six other substances in their system. So most of the drug-related deaths are also what we call polypharmacy, involving a lot of substances, often including alcohol. And by the way, alcohol still causes more deaths in this country than all drug overdoses combined. So there is a simple narrative that's not entirely accurate out there. Um, but not everyone is at equal risk of addiction either. And so training doctors the doctors don't get a lot of training about pain. They get even less training about addiction. And these are two pretty significant problems in our country right now. I would say of the chronic health problems, two of the most prevalent. Um, so we really need to restructure, you know, from the ground up. In terms of what you were saying about your husband, I, I think there is a lot of apprehension and to some degree that's warranted. It's a medication that has risks. And so you need to take it with a clear head. You need to talk to your doctor about the risks. If your personality starts being affected, you absolutely need to talk to your physician about it. Those are all really important things. One of the problems is, especially um, in the case you mentioned, like surgeries, um, you know, these are not pain management doctors. They're surgeons who are prescribing. And so people don't always get the follow-up that they need. Um, there's uh, an Excellent, and, and a lot of these doctors don't even know how to appropriately taper people off of opioids. So opioids don't cause addiction in most people who use them, but they do cause what we call physical dependence. The brain um, 
becomes dependent and so our endogenous uh, opioids uh, opioids that we have in our body are you know sort of shift in in how they work uh, when we're putting uh, synthetic opioids into our system and so people have to be tapered off um, and if they're tapered off they generally don't have those horrible consequences that you're talking about um, so you know that it, it, that is a really important part of care. Now that happens with other medications as well. It happens with some blood pressure medications. It happens with some uh, medication for depression. It's opioids are certainly not the only medication that cause dependence, but the consequences of stopping very quickly can be dire. In fact, I would highly recommend um, a talk, a TED talk by a guy named Travis Ryder, who like me was a very educated patient. He is a bioethicist at Johns Hopkins. He had a severe accident. He was given opioids for a period of time. And his surgeon finally just said, okay, let's taper you off quickly. And he got so depressed, he almost killed himself. So um, there are really, there, you know, we really are not, a, you know, sort of training people in how to, there's, there's a lack of infrastructure medically in the system, I think, in the medical system. Um, we know historically that pain is best treated through what we call a biopsychosocial model. That's something um, that happened in multidisciplinary pain clinics um, for many years. A lot of those in the last decade or so have been shut down because insurers didn't pay for a, a, a sort of rounded approach to treatment managed care, workers' comp wanted giving people to give people pills and get them back to work quickly. So, you know, there are a lot of things that have happened to incentivize pills sort of over uh, a broad-based care, which I actually received. Um, I was treated in a multidisciplinary pain clinic. And there are a lot of great tools out there to treat pain. They're just not available to a lot of people. So finally, as to Kratom, I... I'm not an expert on Kratom. I do know that the FDA um, has serious concerns about it. They consider it an opiate. Um, there were some deaths from Kratom, I, not, not, not a lot. Um, and it's sort of being discussed as we speak. Uh, I think a lot of people in chronic pain turned to it because of the difficulty in obtaining appropriate pain medication uh, in the sort of opioid crackdown. Such a shame. Antonio, I know you have a question. I, I, find, I find particularly disturbing the fact that you, uh, you need to educate yourself uh, in order to even to deal with the doctor. Uh, so it's, you know, it's quite, you, know, you need you know, a kind of a, a sophisticated patient and to, to be able to manage uh, this if you are in, in, this, in this condition. And the other part is people today, they tend to go to the internet to do all kinds of search, you know, and they will, so, and they end up finding all sorts of things. They might end up on the, you know, looking for those uh, pieces of information that rank on the top of Google or any other search engine. So is there any other places where you can tell that people can go and find information that is consistent? It's consistent. I think it's very, as you said, I think it's very difficult. I think you have to become a fairly educated patient. And most most pain, in, at least in the United States, is treated not by pain management specialists, but by primary care physicians. Um, I think um, going to some of the ma some of the major medical centers uh, have good information about chronic pain. There are pain associations um, that I can actually send. Uh, I can tweet out tomorrow when we do our Twitter chat. Um, that people can check um, about chronic pain. But it is difficult because, especially when people are doing research on the internet, because there is so much misinformation. I mean, unfortunately, the treatment of pain is conflated with drug policy. And that, at least, you know, is, it certainly in the United States causes a lot of problems. We tend to, you know, deal with drugs uh, through prosecution. We tend to criminalize drugs um, and, uh, we tend to tell sort of simple narratives about who's using and why they're using, um, and that can really confuse issues for people. And no, when you're looking at this, do you see any other countries in the world 
with good practices in this area that's something people should look at or and consider uh, in terms of addiction, certainly, um, I think Portugal and, and France and other countries have done a much better job of taking the actual scientific evidence that is out there uh, about medication-assisted treatment um, and harm reduction, which is very compelling evidence. It's very strong. Um, medication-assisted treatment is 50 to 80 percent effective, which very little in, in the system of medicine for any disease is. Um, and in this country, there are stigmas um, and payer issues with getting people treatment um, that other countries simply do not have. Um, I, I don't know of a country that's necessarily treating pain in an ideal way. That's a really interesting uh, question, and it's something I would like to investigate. Do you? No, I, no, I don't. I have to ask Professor my, my um, my wife um, uh, is in, in the condition that uh, is, you know, uh, who has frequently with chronic pain. And I remember <coughs> going, going uh, to a, a visit, <coughs> and it, it was quite uh, difficult because <coughs> the he was not able to understand, and, she, and then she decided to go and talk with a different person. <coughs> And then the person that was able to understand the uh, passed away two years ago. Um, and it was the, the doctor that she had a, a, a very good relationship that was able to understand yeah. her better. And it was acting in two ways. One, he was a doctor, and he was also someone that was a good listener and a good, uh, he was able to advise her in, in many different ways. So she really misses. Uh, someone with that type of knowledge uh, and understanding of being able of putting himself in the position of the patient and advising her <coughs> in a way. Yeah, I mean, I encourage people to keep pushing until they find a compassionate physician uh, for certain. Not everyone has uh, the ability to do that financially, logistically. Um, I, I was just speaking uh, this weekend, actually, at a pain conference to pain doctors in the United States. And this issue of listening came up um, and how important it is to sort of really pay attention to what people are saying, partly in terms of diagnosing pain. A lot of people with chronic pain don't have uh, an appropriate diagnosis um, or it takes years for their pain to be diagnosed. Mine took a few years, actually, um, to sort of be traced back to what had caused it. Um, I think uh, the problem that we're seeing today with all of this is, as I said, we had these multidisciplinary pain centers which were set up to deal with a lot of the consequences of pain in someone's life. So there was psychological support, there was occupational support, there was support in terms of physical therapy. You know, people who have been in pain for a long time. Um, need a, a mix of treatments because it is such has such a strong impact on their lives and their jobs and their families and emotions. Um, so uh, I think right now with the crackdown on opiates, one thing one of the things that's happened in this country is that a lot of doctors are being surveyed. Um, they're um, surveilled by the government there in terms of their prescribing practices and uh, that is causing them to pull back and shut down. Um, so I have a, a great deal of compassion for uh, providers out there as well. Um, yeah. I, I, there's a doctor in my community that I actually um, have gone to him before and taken my, doc, my daughter to uh, about 15 years ago. And I was so impressed with this man. He's so smart and empathetic and compassionate. and um, he he got in trouble um, a, f a few years afterwards, say, and um, what came out in the paper was that he had been uh, prescribing opiates inappropriately, and, and so when, you know, he's being accused of being a, a criminal and a drug dealer, well, so he goes on to court, and by the way, it wasn't <laughs> true, and it was actually the agents had come in and it just sort of looking from afar looked like they were sort of setting this doctor up a bit because and he explained what he had done and he was totally exonerated but 
it made me sad because here is a doctor just trying so hard to do the right thing by his patients, and then agents are coming in and trying to set him up. And I, 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 so there's, there's so many, there's so many different pieces to this, and so much misinformation. Yeah. Yeah. And Kate, before yeah. we started, you talked a little bit about what's happening with what's happening. Yes. Well, with with Oregon, yeah. In 2016, yes. um, the CDC in the United States promulgated what they considered to be guidelines directed to primary care physicians, not pe not physicians who specialize in pain treatment. And most of their guidelines were um, very sensible, basically saying you shouldn't start someone with opioids. You should try other kinds of treatment first. You should have them on the lowest possible dose for the shortest period of time. All of those you know, any, pract any practicing uh, physician is going to agree with those uh, recommendations. But they did two things um, in those recommendations, which again were just guidelines and were directed just to primary care physicians, where they sort of assigned numbers and said, you know, you really, if you're starting with somebody new, a new opioid patient, someone who's naive and has never taken, naive to opioids, has never taken them before, you should be careful in dosing. And they actually put numbers in. They said you shouldn't, you know, should be careful when you go over 50 MME, morphine equivalent milligrams. Um, and you should really justify it if you go over 90. That was with respect to new patients. Um, and then they also said, you know, we're worried about there, there being too much prescribing for acute care. Um, that, it, you know, someone can go in with a sprained ankle and walk away with, 30 pills and use one, and then that is in their medicine cabinet. And what we know is a big problem um, is what we call diversion. We know from national surveys on drug use that most people who misuse prescription pain pills did not receive them from a doctor. They got them from family or friends. They took them from someone's medicine cabinet. They bought them. So having these extra supplies around is a problem. That's a long backdrop to what's happened. Um, it's necessary to understand the Medicaid issue. Um, over time, uh, because there's been sort of uh, 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 politicians and regulators have been concerned about the opioid epidemic, there have been a lot of laws that have been passed. So for example, in most states now, in the United States, you can't get more than a three or seven day supply. That's even if you have a hip surgery without going back to the doctor, getting another prescription, which can be a problem for people in serious pain who don't have a regular pain giver, people who live in rural areas, but that's the reality. Um, the other thing that's happening that's really troubling is that the dose recommendation is being applied to current pain patients. That's not what the CDC recommendations said at all. They had a separate recommendation for what we call legacy patients, people who've been taking opioids for chronic pain for a long time. All they said is you need to continue to assess that the benefits outweigh the risks. They didn't assign any dosage requirements. But what's happening is that um, the DEA and to some degree state medical boards have adopted those dosage requirements. And if a doctor is has a number of patients who are in that range, in that 50 to 90 range, Sometimes they're subject to uh, more surveillance because of that, without any regard to whether they happen to be treating really serious illness. You know, patients who are very, very sick who may need those medications. So what's happening with um, Medicaid, a couple things happened. Um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services this year um, put out a proposed recommendation saying that they were going to allow insurance companies to stop covering opioid medication for, this is for Medicare, um, over 90 MME. Now, there are millions of people taking a higher dose than that. And fortunately, a lot of doctors and even the people who wrote the CDC guidelines came back and said, you know, that is destructive. There are serious dangers in forcibly taking people off. Uh, we know that people are experiencing medical decline. We know that people are committing suicide as a result. You know, you, you, you don't, you should not do that. And so, they didn't. They decided instead to, to do sort of a, an additional safety check at that level. Uh, but right now, in some states like Oregon, there is a current proposal to deny uh, pain medication, uh, opioid pain medication, longer than 90 days to people with uh, chronic pain that is not active cancer. 
Um, and that um, is is just a, it's a terrible thing. Um, Medicaid certainly is going to disproportionately affect people with disabilities. It's going to disproportionately affect people who are indigent. Um, and uh, it there are evidence on what happens to people with these sort of compelled tapers is is very negative. You're not helping patients. You're harming them, um, which is you know a dangerous thing. Now uh, Beth Darnell, who's a wonderful pain psychologist at Stanford, testified just Thursday about the Oregon issue. Um, she has done a lot of it. Uh, she's running a program on how voluntarily and appropriately to taper people if they want to be tapered down, because we did have some looser prescribing. We did perhaps we do we may have people on opioids um, who shouldn't be on them or who are on too high a dose for the you know where the risks may exceed the benefit. So she's running programs on voluntary um, tapering, and she said, you know, this is this is the devastating. We know uh, from the Veterans Administration where they tried to do some of this that it increases the risk of suicide, um, and that it is a very dangerous practice. So we'll see what comes of it. I've done some advocacy. I wrote a letter to Oregon um, that was signed by a lot of pain doctors, a lot of the sort of thought leaders, um, the heads of the major associations. Um, cautioning against this, saying this proposal will do substantially more harm than good, but you know, we'll see. Yeah. And interesting, yeah. In, in that case, interestingly, what they're proposing to do is sort of a distortion of of a good model. They're proposing to say, okay, we'll cover acupuncture and yoga, but we won't cover pain medicine. And the truth is that some of these things can help, like some of these, you know, massage. Uh, acupuncture, meditation, some of these practices, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, some of these practices can really help people. These are these multidisciplinary biopsychosocial model of treating pain that I was talking about. Um, but the problem is they're using it as an either or, and that's not appropriate. A doctor should be able to have access to, and people should be able to have access to the full range of treatments that might help them and not, you know, saying, okay, you know, sort of, we're either gonna not medicate you at all, or, and we'll let you, you know, go do meditation. Um, and it, it's also just an odd thing with respect to pain. I mean, undoubtedly, this will help people with, you know, you know, someone with diabetes is gonna be helped by assistance with exercise and certain lifestyle changes. But we're not saying don't give them insulin. We're not saying, you know, sort of, or someone with heart disease may be helped by those things as well. Um, and, but we're not saying don't, don't treat their hypertension with medication. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's, it's a shame that the people that are going to be hurt by these laws, like the one in Oregon, are the people with disabilities, the poor people, like you said, the engine. It, it's really a shame that that's happening. And um, I know that we're out of time, but I, I, I want to do a couple of things. First of all, Thank you to Barclays who always supports us. We They bless us with their support. Thank you to Clear Text that does our captioning and we're so grateful to them. Grateful to them. I know you were working on a book and I don't know if your book came out. So I was wondering if you could just tell us um, as we close a little bit about the book. And also I highly recommend, and so does Antonio and Neil, Kate as a speaker. If you have, if you are a good speaker, she's really, you can tell she's brilliant, she's passionate, she's an advocate, she really wants to make a difference. So tell uh, our audience how they can find out about your work and give us an update on your book. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm still writing my book. It hasn't come out yet. Um, and it is basically, um, it springs off of my personal story um, and examines what's happening to patients today and, and the opioid epidemic and tries to give a more balanced approach um, to, to what's going on. Um, and uh, and talks a little bit about healing and what can help us heal as well. Uh, you can find out about me my, uh, uh, at my website, which is www.katemnicholson.com. Uh, that's a middle initial M in there. Um, you can also reach me at kate at katemnicholson.com. Um, I do uh, speak, as I said, I was just speaking this, this weekend. Um, and uh, if you're interested, you can also watch my TEDx talk, which is on my website. Yes, and we'll put all this information out on accesschat.com. But Kate, thank you for your work. It, it's just so important. And it, 
it impacts all of us, all of us. Don't think this doesn't impact you. This impacts all of us. It really does. I mean, even if you vulnerable to pain and living in a human body, just as we're all vulnerable to disability, living in a human body, but um, and not that those are necessarily separable categories, but um, it also affects, you know, family life and friendships and our jobs and, um, you know, uh, pain casts a fairly wide web. So thank you so much for having me on again. I really love the work that you guys do at Access Chat. It's brilliant. And I so appreciate your willingness to um, to amplify this message and to, to talk about pain. Yes, thank, thank you, Kate. Kate. Yes. Thanks, Antonio. Bye, everyone. Bye.